Well, I'm lucky to be here today with Alan Light. Uh, Alan's been um, involved in writing about music and, and being an editor of a number of major publications, including Vibe. And were you the founder of Vibe, or how? Did... I was part of the founding team there. I was uh, the 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 music editor when we initially launched, and then and then took over as the editor in chief uh, about a year after that. Wow, and of course. Um, People will remember Alan from being on uh, VH1 a lot, talking about different music and musicians, and and now he's got a string of successful books, and and the next one is about one of the more interesting figures in music, um, Nina Simone, and and tell me how how did that start? Well, um, people maybe maybe know um, that there was a documentary that came out last year uh, called right. What Happened, Miss Simone that uh was you know widely acclaimed and and actually has ended up with an Oscar nomination for best documentary um, and i think that as the 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 team behind the movie started to see that they were going to get some interest and some traction you know around the festivals and, and such last year um realized that there may be interest in you know from people to to look deeper into this story um and also that they had you know as with any as with any film project they had pulled so much research and so much information and so much stuff that didn't make its way onto the screen that there was a lot of story still left to tell right. and so they you know got in touch with me um to look to do a book that was sort of a a companion and an outgrowth um of the documentary um uh, where they essentially handed over all the research from the film and and all the the amazing stuff that they'd put together and said you know we made we made one version of this story uh within the limits of filmmaking go uh see what you can do with it to try uh -huh. to to take it further from there so that was uh the way that that all you know that all happened it was a pretty it's a pretty rapid process from there but we you know we wanted to get it out at least ahead of hoping for this kind of recognition when award season came along and and uh you know giving people a chance to look even deeper into this amazing story. So they change you to the typewriter, that's what you're saying. That's kind of how it works, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it was, a, it was an interesting way to do it. Um, it was a little bit inside out when you're handed somebody else's research and, and, and everything that they pulled together. On the one hand, it meant access to stuff that you could never get you know, if you were starting cold to, to Nina Simone's diaries and to all the stuff that the family had contributed and put together in interviews that they had done. Um, but it also meant that, you know, so much of the process was just figuring out what what's here. You know, by right. the time you usually sit down to write a story or to write a book or whatever it is, you know what the research is, you kind of know the story you want to tell. And here it really meant spending a lot of time digging through this stuff and figuring out, you know, what do we have here and, and what is it um, that that we want to, you know, that, that we want to get across. Uh, it isn't the usual order of of things but uh we you know we got there in the end well i guess one thing that i'd i'd like to ask is uh you know of course the books that you've written before haven't really been traditional biographies i mean they right. they've been a moment in time or or kind of the history of a song or whatever um what's it like sitting down with with someone's just personal personal papers and, and and everything that goes along with that I mean, yeah. what what does that feel like well it's a, it's a it's a fair question that i've had to you know think through a lot just you know as you said i i tend to like writing stories that are sort of start sort of micro focused and then work outwards from there um to you know i to write a book about one song you know to look at hallelujah and open up from there to look at the phase in prince's career where he was working on purple rain just kind of those 18 months or so, and then see how far, how much you can bring to that. Um, I guess the closest experience that I had to this was working on Greg Allman's autobiography with him, um, which, uh, you know, which in some ways is a similar, it doesn't mean digging through research in the same way, but it means trying to pull out a story um, and really, you know, cover a, a big life with a lot of, a lot of stuff in it and a lot of, Right. ups and downs and, and a lot of uh, of different elements to it and try to figure out try to find a balance for uh how to how to do that and with Nina's story um 
you know, it's a very – she's a very complicated, very troubled figure. Um, it's a very emotional and very personal story to tell. And you really do try to you, – you know, you want a kind of delicate balance between uh, being honest to the story that – you know, to the life that she lived with – with the the peaks and the lows that were there um, and not get, you know, there were times where I just felt like, God, I could just tip over into like, here's a half a dozen really horrible stories from this one right. phase of her life. And they're all fascinating and riveting stories to tell, but you don't want it to all of a sudden become just this tragedy where that overwhelms you know, the triumphant parts of the story and say, well, you know, maybe I can do two stories that are the most you know, the most telling out of that and not just pile on um, and, and and throw the whole thing out of whack. So, um, you know, it's certainly a different thing trying to calibrate 70 years of somebody's life, um, you know, again, with this with this incredible range and, and uh, you know, variation of experience than, than the sort of deep dive closer up thing that I've done the last few books. Right. Do you um, how much how much did you know about Nina Simone before starting writing this book? I knew you know I, I knew some um, I knew some of the music I knew I'd read um, you know there have been other biographies or other things that have been done over the years things that have gone nothing that's in print right now I don't think um, so I knew the the outlines of the story but it wasn't you know for me to do a Prince book that was something that's been a long time obsession, something sure. that could sort of wake me up in the middle of the night and have me start <laughs> talking about Prince, and I'd come up with, you know, with a lot. Um, I was not as fluent in Nina's full story as that, but I was, uh, you know, I was aware of and was a fan and knew the, 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 uh, the shape of it. Um, sure. Which is also an interesting. You're, you know, learning much more. Although you go in with less preconception. Um, and as long as there's the you know, again the ability to to get the time and and really work through the stuff that's there, um, feeling like you're you're learning along the way and 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 seeing what jumps out and what things are are stronger rather than going in with you know with a that you already have your your set vision of this person. Sure. Um, so it's you know there's there's trade off to that. Uh, well, and and I think just to give some people some idea if they are not familiar with Nina Simone, I mean, she's she's a very sultry vocal vocalist, but not in the sense of um, not in the sense of a lot of romantic love songs. I mean, Nina's material is very hard hitting and and uh, very political. I mean, she sings some of the classics too, but. Uh, she's not dealing with with lightweight material by any stretch. No, not at all. And and one thing that really became more apparent, you know, just going deeper into the music, it's, you know, one thing is it's really hard to classify what it is that that Nina sure. did. Uh, <laughs> you know, she gets called a jazz singer. She hated that. She felt like she wasn't a jazz singer, and that was just what people said because she was black and was a singer. Um, she got, you know, she was called the high priestess of soul. But it wasn't really soul singing like what Otis Redding did or what, you know, the Stax or Motown artists did. Right. Um, she could kind of live with being called a folk singer just because she felt that at least conveyed the, the, the range of what she was doing. But you look at the material that she was doing, and it's hard to come up with anybody who's done, um, you know, such a – uh, such an incredible range of uh, of music from Israeli folk songs to Bob Dylan covers to jazz standards to you know the, it's it, I, she would think you know she would do Bee Gees songs um, yeah she did a lot you know, of all uh, all kinds of stuff uh, Leonard Cohen songs and George Harrison songs but also uh, traditional slave songs and southern sort of play songs um it's hard to find you know there's no category for what it was that she did it's hard to find anybody to compare her to and you become aware of that as a you know as a limitation um yeah. that you know she came out of the gate with this with this big hit um singing i loves you porgy from right. porgy and bess and right. so there was this initial idea of her as you know almost sort of a 
an inheritor to, to Billie Holiday, um, right. lots of comparisons to Billie Holiday. She had a very, you know, mixed emotions about that comparison and about Billie Holiday in, in general. Um, and then well, the things that she did didn't really follow. I mean, there are things that connect to that kind of a recording, but other things that would have, that have nothing to do with that. Um, so just, you know, as an artist, um, it was a really unique, uh, I don't, you know, path that she took with her music. And then the music itself, you know, she came from a, uh, you know, very strong classically trained background. Uh, right. The assumption throughout her youth and, and her training was that she was going to be the first great black female classical pianist that America right. had produced. And then she sort of didn't make the last cut uh, at the conservatory level and in some ways never recovered from that. Um, she always viewed herself, you know, I think that there was this real tension because I think she viewed herself as an artist that she came right. from this kind of world of high art that was played in theaters for attentive audiences who took it seriously. And then she was out playing jazz clubs and playing right. nightclubs and would get into these confrontations with audiences when she didn't think they were being respectful enough or attentive enough and, you know, really damaged her career in a lot of ways from uh, all of these struggles, even with her supporters, because she did not think of herself as an entertainer. She thought of herself as an artist, and it right. was a very clear distinction to her what that meant. Well, and even even her relationship with Billie Holiday's music, she would say one thing about it and then turn around and say something completely opposite about it. Oh, even within the same, going back and reading old interview transcripts and old you know things, she would, within the same conversation, she right. would say different things about that. Um, you know, and you sort of understand it in some ways. I think that she, this, you know, certainly somebody that she respected the, the artistry and the sort of groundbreaking musical things that Billie Holiday was doing. She felt uh, very um, kind of sullied by the association with the tragedy of Billie Holiday and the drug use and the, you know, all the offstage stuff and, and what that represented. Um, so, um you know, in this search for what did you call Nina Simone or what did you compare her to, um, that was in some ways a, a kind of obvious touchstone, but also, um, you know, one with some, some big upside and some big downside for her. Well, and, and, you know, one thing that when I first started exploring jazz in, in my early 20s, and, you know, I bought a Nina Simone record or two, I didn't understand at that time that she was the genius playing piano on those records, too. Right. And, I mean, I just don't know of anyone that I like to listen to play piano more than her. I mean, her her stuff is just incredible. No, her playing is really extraordinary. And, again, that's, I think, what you, you appreciate going back and going deeper into this stuff, that um, – Obviously, anybody who's a, a singer, you think of you think of that first, right. uh, in some ways. But her playing is again really unlike anybody else that was out there. Um, mm. Again, largely because of this very strong uh, right. and very deep classical training that she had, she was just capable of uh, a harmonic sophistication um, that was really you know beyond most jazz players. And right. her. Uh, her sort of long time, the, the guitar player, Al Shackman, who was her longest musical collaborator and, and somebody very close to her her whole life. And at one point he recalls Miles Davis saying to him, I, you know, I've never heard anybody who can p play two separate lines like that, who can I sing know. and who's playing not just accompaniment, but is essentially, you know, both the singer and the piano soloist simultaneously. Right. Um, and that's a you know it's it's a it's astounding to go back to some of this stuff. Well, I I love uh, you know I I love the song um, "Love Me or Leave Me," mm -hmm. and the two-handed stuff that she's doing there. I, I mean, it's just hard to describe how how fun it feels and yet how how deep things are moving. I mean, it, it's just really an incredible line. That's well, and even going back that, you know, the, the, I loved you Porgy, that was her breakthrough and her, you know, her first recording. Um, I mean, that's an incredibly sophisticated playing. 
Right. Uh, and and that's to go back to like that's the first essentially her first time in a in a recording studio. Um uh-huh. you know, and, and somebody who at that time really didn't think of herself as a singer and as a, you know, this, this wasn't even the, the slot that she was putting herself in. Um, and the, the level of musicianship uh, is just unreal. Um, and even sort of the throwaway stuff, you know, she had late in her life, you know, one thing that people might have some familiarity with was when uh, the song My Baby Just Cares For Me was rediscovered and it was put in a perfume, was put in a Chanel commercial and turned into, you know, certainly a very big hit in Europe. Um, and, you know, there was a video that, got a lot of play, a sort of playful thing. And this was a song that she literally tacked on at the last minute to her first album because they thought there weren't enough up, up-tempo songs on it. So nothing that she'd ever thought about. And it isn't like a bravura piece. It isn't some magnificent thing. But the solo that she, this kind of shuffle solo that she plays on that song, it's almost got this kind of reggae, this sort of offbeat thing to it. Sure. Um, that's just a wild piece of playing that just sort of came out of nowhere and she never really went back to. And here's this thing that, you know, decades later popped up and people really responded to. Well, and and I think that actually your mentioning of a commercial um, is an interesting point because at various times, you know, she had this, she had a very interesting and odd feeling about commercialization in her music because at some points she's literally pushing for spots and things and spots and commercials at the same time holding this kind of odd standoffish approach to the masses and her music well this is you know one of the one of the tensions one of the many tensions uh built into this career was she wanted that that sort of high artistry uh respect and freedom um, but she certainly wanted, once she got some sense of material gains, you know, she wanted the big house and the pool and she wanted to make money, uh, but she kind of wanted to make money and not have to work for it. Uh, <laughs> when she was working, that was something, you know, what she was working for was something else. The work was for a kind of pure excellence and, and you know, an art. Um, the commerce was, you know, is a... There's a story in there from her, you know, her husband and manager at the time saying her favorite thing was when people would use her music in a commercial because it meant she got a check and she didn't have to do anything. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and when she gets asked by Jane Fonda to play um, some benefit shows for, um, was it Black Soldiers? Is that what right, it was? Right. It's, it's, uh, that's v- 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 coming back from Vietnam. Yeah. Yeah. And and she says that's fine if you will put put my music in your movies. <laughs> right. If you're not going to pay me, then promise me that you'll use my you know, music in the next soundtrack so that I'll get something out of this. Uh, <laughs> so there's a, uh, you know, there's a very hard pragmatism, you know, that's attached here. Um, right. You know, and again, we're, we're also talking about somebody with, you know, I mean, not to veer too hard onto this, but somebody with you know, significant emotional problems right. um, and, and mental issues and things that, you know, things would, would, whip in and out of focus pretty fast, especially as she got later into her career. Um, some of these swings in Adam, and some of them are just, that's who she was. And then some of them are uh, the things that she was battling, uh, well, you know, for her life and, and increasingly as her life went on. And she, she married uh, a man early on, but then she divorced him and she married Al, Al Stroud. And Al is kind of an interesting character because he's, got some really villainous qualities, but he, he doesn't seem to be the kind of inept shyster that, that often appears in these kind of stories. Yeah, it's a, it's a very complicated and, and, you know, one thing that was hard about this project, um, but I think hard about any, anybody who's, you know, working with, with her or with an artist like her is, you know, she's not, uh, she's certainly not a, 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 always a reliable narrator. Uh, right. You know, she had written a memoir during her life that's kind of, you know, fascinating and maddening because it's so in, wildly inaccurate. Like there's <laughs> stuff that's certainly that's that's in there that's interesting and of use, but she'll say things happened in the 80s that happened in the 60s. Like it's not even close. It's right. not even a year off. It's decades <laughs> off. So she has no, you know, so the relationship with her husband, um, 
she just, you know, it bounces all over the place. In some, you know, at some points, she is very grateful for him stepping in and sort of professionalizing and strategizing a career for her. Um, that very quickly turns into uh, anger with him for making her work too hard. Right. Um, which the guys in the band, you know, all say we wanted to work harder. You know, right. she would say we, we would go to Europe. You know, when you go to Europe, you want to be as efficient as you can and and you know work as often as you can. And she would insist on two days off between shows. And you know, by the time it was all done, we'd hardly make any money because you couldn't play enough to justify all the off days. And in some ways, you know, a very very hard thing to know what to do with <clears throat> that features you know pretty prominently in the film as well what's clear is very early in their relationship when they're engaged but before they're married um andy stroud uh they have a fight and andy stroud beats the hell out of her um in a way that you know is this you know they both describe very graphically um right. he admits to and and describes very graphically as well they still went for, you know she she wondered about the marriage but she still went forward with the marriage and and what is very difficult to assess is, you know, she'll sometimes make references that there, you know, that this was a pattern and that there were other beatings and there were other attacks. There's nothing that she particularly quantified or or you know gave detail about. He says, and he's no, you know, neither of them are still alive. He said, you know, this did happen this one time. I know what, you know, I realize what that was, but then she would hold this over me and say that this was a pattern in our relationship. And it wasn't, it was this thing, you know, this isolated thing. Now, I don't know what I'm, you know, how to accurately present that and be fair to what her perception of the situation was and what his was. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, obviously what matters is that it weighed on her so significantly that she was able to, but just seeing what her rec what her recall is of other incidents and how you know inaccurate her own memories could be sometimes you know how you just don't know at a certain point so you're right. just trying to present here's what it is that they said about it and here's how what this may have what this may have meant you know well but it certainly seems like you know i mean kind of excluding lisa their daughter and you know it seems like some of the people that worked around them both had and and I said Al earlier, but it's it's Andy Stroud. Yep. Um, I think I was combining Al Shackman and right. Andy Stroud there. But um, they certainly seem to have. Uh, I mean, they seem to have had high opinions of him. Who he was a what a New York City police. He was a cop. Officer. Yeah, he was a lieutenant in, in the police force. Um, Decided to be and a music he, guy. he you know was around the entertainment business. He was based in Harlem, so you know he sort of was in that world a little bit and put that career to the side to go be, you know, to manage her. Um, uh -huh. And, you know, and we know this over and over again from so many stories, it's always difficult. You know, it's always complicated when you move into those family members who are your managers and your representatives and personal and emotional and business things all get, you know, very, very tied up very quickly. Um you know, but who knows? She would complain. She would say he was the worst thing that ever happened to her. And then until her dying days would say, I should have stayed with Andy or I wonder if Andy would take me back. He's the only, you know, she, there's this, particularly after that recurrent theme with her of sort of chasing these very idealized, powerful men, finding a way to kind of screw up or sabotage those relationships and then trying to put them back together after it was too late and never, you know, there was some, some vision of relationships or of marriage or of men or something in her head, which, you know, many attribute to her relationship to her father, um, that, you know, that she was never able to, to resolve. It seems like the closest that she did come was, you know, during at least the, the early stages of her marriage to Andy. Um, and then these are things that just continue to play out through the, the rest of her days. Well, and, and you know, she, she goes to Barbados, and is it the prime minister of Barbados that she The ends prime up, minister, yes. Um, um, relationship with. Um, yeah, these sequence, you know, this, this uh, and then this very mysterious story after she moves to Africa, 
when she moves to Liberia and has this relationship with this rich palm oil magnate or something that, you know, some of it is just impossible to decipher in her own telling exactly what was happening, how much of this was something she was creating in her head, how much of this was something that was really going on. Um, her, you know, her mental state was continuing to, uh, you know, to, to deteriorate or at least to become more erratic at this point. And, you know, there's, so there are these sequence of these, these, these big powerful men who were obviously at least interested in this, you know, recording star with this big personality that she had, sure. but were these real things that were, uh, you know, that were headed toward marriage and, and, and long-term relationships, or was that just something that she was fantasizing? Who knows? Uh -huh. And, and, you know, I mean, clearly there are just a couple of true like breaks from reality. It seems like, you know, days and days of, of just kind of, upheaval, you know, that that accompany what was, you know, a pretty amazing musical career throughout the 50s and 60s and, and you know, just groundbreaking things as well because she's certainly there. Uh, in fact, she's very close to the Malcolm X family, probably more so after his death, but uh, you certainly get kind of the whole spectrum of um, of black life and and the the movements that were going on at that time. Yeah, and I think that, you know, she, early in her life, um, you know, she kind of put all the chips on this career in classical music. You know, that uh -huh. was what everything was pointing toward. That was what she had staked everything on. And then that doesn't fully pan out. And she's kind of then looking for something to to believe in the way uh -huh. that she believed in that. And she finds the civil rights movement and she finds activism and she finds the ability to connect her music to this movement. Um, and, uh, y you know, and, and, and she has a purpose, you know, it's sort of, she has a purpose again. She has a reason to do this again. And then she kind of moves all her chips over to, to that, you know, puts them on that number. And then as the movement, you know, as things come apart the way that they did, Right. You know, through the assassinations and the infiltration and, you know, everything sure. that happens uh, to the civil rights movement, she, you know, she's kind of, she's not, she's maybe not the last one standing and still, you know, still yelling about the principles that they were fighting for after others were either taken away or taken out or moved on. Um, mm -hmm. But you get the feeling that, you know, having then committed everything she had to the movement and lost that. That was there was kind of that's when she kind of starts to break, you know, that she she then didn't have something that she had that passion and that belief and that uh, you know full commitment to, um, right. and then you know who you know how how do you know which comes first whether her these breakdowns are a result of that or whether that's what was coming anyway, um, you know she was never diagnosed as bipolar. But I think certainly from our perspective now, when you look at what it was that she was going through, that seems to be what, you know, people believe she was she was dealing with and, and suffering from and, you know, didn't have we didn't the world didn't know a lot of the things that we know decades later about these conditions and what the right medications and she was very resistant to taking those medications. And, you know, as we know, especially a lot of artists and a lot of people who are channeling their emotional lives and their the genius of, of their creativity, um, you know, they don't wanna they don't wanna dull that. Uh right. they don't wanna lose that. And so right. the notion of these drugs that sort of flatten you out a little bit are very difficult. You know, and, and uh my editor pointed out at one point and I think it I put it in there, it's interesting that we, we think so much about the careers that were ruined by artists who were taking drugs, uh -huh. seeking this kind of, you know, ecstatic experience in some ways, you know, you watch her career being falling apart because she isn't taking drugs, <laughs> yeah. you know, because this thing that could potentially have, you know, leveled her out and sustained her that she stayed away from that. And that was uh, what ended up leading to a lot of her, you know, a lot of the demise. Right. Well, you know, and there are just, it's interesting because she actually experiments with hallucinogens much earlier than than most people were and 
Um, you know, I mean, it, there's a lot of great stuff in there about the period where she's kind of rising as an artist and, and in that community very much with the early folk singers and the comedians and uh, being at the village gate and things like that. But I, I, there is one portion that I really enjoyed and that is the thought of, um, of her performing with Charo in Las Vegas. Which yes. If you know about her, you just know that Las Vegas, she should just draw a hundred mile circle around that and stay away because she just, can't stand what would be going on there. But, you know, and I think that's it, – it, it's indicative of, you know, what her her vision of her career and, and Andy Stroud, you know, seeing that there was the potential to make her into a bigger mainstream kind of an artist. I mean, seeing uh -huh. the success that Aretha Franklin had, the success that somebody like, you know, Nancy Wilson had uh – -huh. um, and, and and these were people that they knew and they socialized with, and she would say, why is Diane Carroll getting on TV and I can't get on TV or these people are getting Broadway shows? And he'd say, well, you know, if you want to get those kind of those kind of things, you have to stop insulting your audience right. or not showing up for gigs or, you know, like there's, there's a kind of a, a protocol that gets you to that. So you can see why he would think, okay, Vegas is like the big – that was – mainstream entertainment in mid 60s you know that was the the top of the mountain and so you know that becomes really a goal for andy but you just know this is going to be a disaster for her and <laughs> it certainly proves to be well you you say in the book at some point that one of the biggest excitements about going to a nina simone concert was whether it was going to happen well, I think that became, you know, uh, certainly part of the whole part of the story and part of the, the energy around her. Um, it's, you know, I don't want to say it's quite like, you know, uh, Axl Rose situation, but, uh, you know, there was this question of, you know, you'd go, was, was she going to get there? If she got there, was she going to be able to play the show? If she played the show, would she be able to get through it? Would she end up in a fight with the audience? You know, and that then that became part of her, you know, became part of the mystique and part of the story. But, you know, as we know, that's always a dangerous, whenever the, you know, the, the offstage story takes over from the performance, it's a, it's sure. a, slippery road to go down yeah. um but certainly that was you know that was built into uh the the project at a, at a certain point for her what was the most um what was the most interesting thing you you learned in writing this book oh man um uh, how do you begin to answer that <laughs> i mean i think the, the the most interesting thing from my end that i learned um just in the in the in the work and the writing part of it i think was how to you know, was how to how to address some of these the sensitivities of the things that we're we're talking about. I mean, when you're when you're talking about writing about, um, you know, spousal abuse, and right. it's not, and you can't talk to these people about it, and you're working from old documents, and you know, that's there's just it's a challenge to figure out how to tell those stories and feel like you're being fair and being accurate and being sensitive and, and sort of what the stakes are around doing that. Um, I mean, that was, you know, it was hard, but it was certainly uh, a, a important thing to, to work through uh, as, as a writer. Um, I think the most interesting, I mean, I don't know the most interesting stuff for her. I think that some of it really is re was, was reappreciating some of the, the music. I mean, some of the things that we talked about in the beginning here about how, just how uncategorizable her music was how unique uh, her work was, um, the the level of musicianship and the stuff that she was doing. I mean, I think those were you know those are certainly uh, amazing things to learn about, um, and you know and getting inside. Certainly, I think the phase where she's really plugged into the civil rights movement, and right. is um, you know that she played at the rally at the end of the Selma march as right. you know documented in the film last year and just reading those stories of what it took to to get mm -hmm. to you know yeah. they had to charter a private plane to be able to make it to the march because she was playing a, a a club a week you know at a club in New York City the the owner said that's important 
you know, you should go take the night and go. They get one plane and they, they, they uh, essentially, you know, protesters against the march kind of barricaded the, the, the landing strip <laughs> so that they couldn't actually land there. They had to right. sort of, you know, reconfigure, move to another airport. Um, meantime, they're trying to figure out how to distribute the, the weight from the guitar and the amp and stuff in this four-seater plane so that it could, you know, continue to fly and not tip over. Um, just, you know, getting back inside that moment and, and the relationships that she had with people like Andrew Young and like Stokely Carmichael and, uh-huh. you know, many of those activists and, and, and getting inside that community. And she was always very clear, you know, she, she did some of those marches with, with, uh, with Dr. King, but she is very outspoken. She, the first time that she met Martin Luther King, she met him and said, I just want you to know, I am, I am, I'm not a believer in nonviolence. Exactly. <laughs> you know? um, he said, well, that, you know, that's okay. We're, we're, we're glad to have you here, you know? Um, but she was, you know, much more uh, closely aligned with a, a more activist and more radical worldview about uh, these issues. And, um, you know, and, and and just reading the the sort of first hand documents of those experiences is pretty uh you know, it's, it's pretty incredible history to get inside. Right. Um and then the later stories, you know, they're 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 heartbreaking, um, as she's you know, it just became very difficult to even track where she's living at certain moments. She's moving around so frequently and trying to figure out, you know, where does she belong? Where should she be? She goes to Africa. She says she's the happiest she was in her life was when she was in Africa, but then she's too far from her daughter, and she ends up with this broken, again, this, this relationship with this guy that uh, it's, it's a big mystery what it was really all about, and she leaves from there. And then she really, she's bouncing back and forth between Europe and Los Angeles and Switzerland, and she moves to Montreal for a minute and just you know, ends up leaving there, leaving all the stuff in her apartment and driving away and never coming back. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's heartbreaking to read about this very, very difficult, um, you know, sort of near final stages of her life. Um, but that's part of the story too. Right. Well, it's a, it's a really interesting book and it's hitting store shelves on February 9th, correct? Correct. Feb 9. Yes. And um, uh, you can pre-order it, and and it's uh, it's really worth your time if you've got any interest in in you know not only the music of the time but just the the whole vibe of what was going on. And and she's just such an interesting character. And uh, you know, and in the meantime, see the movie too, uh, especially yeah. <laughs> while we're in this run up to to the Oscars here. It's uh, it's you know that's the it's easy, even easier to recommend with that behind it. <laughs> um, so, Alan, um, you you wrote a book a couple of years ago on on Prince and the making of Purple Rain, and I I just want to know that that thing that we can see on YouTube of the Wendy and Lisa version of the Revolution and all that, and and that was it First Avenue that they're appearing yes. at there. And you know, just when the the screen is dark and then um, the guitar comes up, um, and and they're playing Purple Rain for the first time, and uh, tell me tell me about that and how that then relates to the making of everything. Yeah, well, it's actually it's the opening scene in in, in the book, um, and right. and if you find it on YouTube, you're lucky because it's uh, it doesn't stay up for very long because right. it <laughs> polices this stuff very closely, and it tends to go up and then get smacked back down. You know, it's, it's a so sort of whack a mole all the time. <laughs> it's such an amazing, you know, that's it's such an uh, an amazing story. So they uh, this is in the summer of 1983, and and. Um, you know, and, and Prince is sort of still started work on this movie. Not really clear yet what it's going to be. They're still hammering their way through it. And and it didn't really make any sense that he was making a movie to begin with. This was a guy who had kind of one and a half, you know, big pop hits. He was right. not a huge mainstream star, you know, not the kind right. of guy that, that gets to make a feature film. And to cover the costs for – he was making all of the – 
musicians and, and actors and, and people he was going to put in the film, he was making them take acting classes and dance classes, which is <laughs> such a hilarious, like, old Hollywood. You know, he was kind of obsessed with old Hollywood and the studio system. And so he's like, that's what I need to do. I need to get them trained. We'll have them take classes. So to pay back off the... Uh, the the local dance company whose facilities he was using um he plays this benefit at first avenue which was the club is still the club in minneapolis you know where he he played a lot at the time and they play this encore they play purple rain it's the first time that they've played the song in public uh-huh. this is the first show that wendy melvoin is in you know is 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 has joined. She just joined the revolution. She just joined the band. She's a 19-year-old kid playing, you know, lead guitar. This is her first show, and they play this, you know, 12-minute version of this song nobody had ever heard before. <laughs> and that recording is edited, and is the version of Purple Rain that we all know from the, you know, the soundtrack that we know every every note of and every sound of and becomes the defining, in some ways, the defining recording of his career. That's the one, it's basically unchanged from right. his performance. Now think about what kind of discipline, what kind of rehearsal goes into <laughs> the first time you play a song on a stage, that's the take that you keep. And that's the song that becomes ends up becoming the climax of the film and becoming, you know, again, the signature song for you. And that's it. There's no, there's a, uh, there was a verse that's edited. The intro is shortened. The guitar solo is shortened. There are cuts that are made, but there's basically, there's some, a little bit of strings that are added uh, towards the end. Um, You know, a little bit of echo and stuff that's thrown on there and that's it. Nothing is, is re-recorded. Nothing is overdubbed. That's the thing. It's so incredible to me, and just says the kind of you know musical operation that he runs. That you know, first time. You know, every time out is for perfection, including the first time. Right, right. And, uh, it, and that, if if anyone does get a chance to see that video, it is. It's just so you know stunning and. And atmospheric and and well, and you good. see it begin, and there's this long intro, and you're listening, and you sort of, are, but then when it kicks in, and when he's actually singing it, you realize, oh, that's the one that I know. Yeah, you know exactly. That's that's the one. All the little vocal asides and woos and you know yeah. fills and everything, they're all right there. And and of course, he's such a magical guitar player too, and you know he's he's playing on it as well. But uh, but just the sound of her Rickenbacker and. I mean, it's just, it's a really just perfect moment. So, uh, yeah, so that was, uh, that, that was the opening scene for the book and seemed like that got to a lot of things about him, you know. And, uh, and after that was done, the guy, who, the, the director of the film, who was also a rookie, you know, recent film student graduate, was at the club that night. And after the show, he, he came to Prince and he's like, man, we need, you know, we need, this, you know, we sort of still need one big ballad, emotional high point for the song, for the for the movie, and I think that might be the song. Uh-huh. And uh, and Prince says, oh, you know, pr- yeah, Purple Rain. Well, I guess I I kind of feel like it isn't done, but you know, maybe okay. Um, and says, you know, at least in in the director's recollection, well, if we're going to use that song, then maybe we should call the movie Purple Rain. Oh, wow. So all of that comes together in this one night, in this one performance. Um, at, you know, at a club a year before the movie's out when nobody even knows that this thing is happening. Right. And and not not nearly as many people knew Prince either. I mean, he had 1999. That was a huge hit. But he was not the kind of figure he would be a year later. Well, and that's the thing that, you know, going back and thinking about, you know, when I was thinking about the book and wanting to do it, you know, the first thing you realize is, like, it makes no sense that this movie got made. Like, it makes <laughs> no sense. There's no way that you look at the – here's – you know, he goes to them, and here's the guy who has – you know, again, uh, he had 1999, he had Little Red Corvette. Those right. were the, the pop hits, and those had just happened. Um, you know, so he's, he happened to just have two big two big hit singles. Okay, not everybody who gets two hit singles goes to make a feature. Sure. You know, that's just, you know. And so he says, you know, I want to make this movie. We're going to, my band, it's going to, you know, my band are going to be the actors. <laughs> uh, 
it's you know which is a, a mixed you know which is a band that's black and white and male and female and doesn't look like any other band that's out there. Right. And we're going to use this first time director who's never made a movie before, and we're going to shoot it in Minneapolis in the winter. Right. Like, what part of that sounds like, oh, that's going to be a blockbuster? <laughs> you know, it sounds ridiculous. It sounds like that. Who would, why would you, would any studio ever say, we'll give you money to do that? Uh, but they found a way to do it and obviously, you know, <laughs> paid back the entire cost of the movie in its opening weekend. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a stunning story. And, you know, um, you also wrote a book about the song, Hallelujah, which is a, Leonard Cohen song and um, was probably most famously covered by Jeff Buckley. And the only thing I just want to ask about that is uh, this morning I woke up and looked on Facebook and a friend of mine was talking about the Rufus Wainwright version of that song and, and not even knowing that it was a Leonard Cohen song, but um, you know, thinking of as a Jeff Buckley song and, and then everyone kind of chimed in on, um, well, you know, they have this as a wedding song, and it seems like a highly appro- inappropriate huh. wedding song. And I, what what kind of – how do you see that? Is that something you see regularly? Oh, I, you know, I see it constantly, you know, <laughs> and that's what's uh, – you know, what was so – fascinating to me as I thought about this song was I, first of all, I can't, I can't think of any, any other song that had the trajectory that this song had, that it came out. Nobody, when Leonard Cohen put this song out in 1984, nobody knew this song. Right. His, the, the, the record label re- actually rejected the, uh, the album, you know, Columbia wouldn't, didn't put this album out. He ended up putting it out on some smaller indie label. None of the reviews mentioned Hallelujah, just nothing, flatline. And 10 years later, you know, there's a sequence of events, and then Jeff Buckley cuts it. But the Jeff Buckley, I mean, we all sort of now look back at Jeff Buckley's influence and think of him as kind of a major figure. At the time, Jeff Buckley was really kind of a bust. There was all this oh, hype around oh. him, and then the, nobody bought Grace when right. it came out, you know, so, <laughs> you know, yeah, well, it's, you know, the musicians bought it and people, and then it sort of became this mythic thing that, you know, especially after his death, oh, people came around to, but it's almost, you know, 20 years that this song kind of floats around with nobody noticing before it takes on this momentum and the snowball starts rolling downhill and it starts getting more covers and used in more films and, and then becomes this international anthem is global. I just can't think of any other, the songs that you think of in that category, you think of Imagine, you think of Bridge Over Troubled Water, you think of A Change Is Gonna Come, you know, but these were all songs that when they came out, people understood right away, oh, that's an important song. They were hits, they were covered, they were a big deal, they were, you know, I, I can't think of anything else that sort of languished in obscurity for so long and then became this, you know, constant presence in our yeah. lives. So I was, you know, really interested to see how does that how does that happen? Um and I think because it it took all that time and because at a certain point I think Leonard just kind of let it go wherever it was going to go and was not protective of it in any way. Right. You started getting these very different interpretations of it. You started getting different you know, people would use different parts of the song or drop certain verses or certain lines. And it really became that the song meant whatever it meant to you. Right. You know, that it's, you know, we want to sing it in a church service, but we don't feel like the verse about he tied her to the kitchen chair, you know, belongs <laughs> in a church service. So you don't do it. Right. And that's kind of sanctioned and it's okay. And that malleability allowed the song to kind of work, you know, around a lot of corners and through a lot of cracks and find itself in, in, in lots of different places that, you know, are, you know, again, are kind of surprising for a song with these very elaborate, you know, poetic literary lyrics, very elusive imagery. Um, and, you know, and, and what I found was, you know, I wish I could take credit for the kind of old school reporting that I was, you know, in, in the book where I have people, just regular people in life talking about using it, the song at weddings or at funerals or at religious services or at, um, you know, somebody who's 
child, you know, whose who's newborn was sick and, and died, you know, uh-huh. five days in, in their life. And they played the song at the at the memorial for this newborn, sure. uh, finding somebody who named their daughter Hallelujah after the song because of what the song had meant to them in their life. I wish that I felt like I really worked hard to find all these stories. The fact is everybody has some story about this song. Everybody that I mention it to, oh, we played it at my cousin's wedding or at the, you know, funeral or at the whatever. Um, it, was, it, it just surrounds us all the time in all of these different ways. And, you know, yeah, that becomes the argument. Is it appropriate for this or for that? Well, if, you, if that's what it means to you, then it's appropriate. Exactly. Well, and and I wanted to ask you one more question before we go. I, I yeah. just wanted to talk for a second about um, the piece that you did, um, the obituary you did on on David Bowie, and and mm-hmm. tell me uh, what your <clears throat> feelings are about Bowie. Well, I think you know. I think probably a lot of people would say I, I was. I really didn't. Wouldn't have anticipated that that Bowie's passing would hit me as hard right. emotionally as it did. Yeah. Um, and I think there's two things. I think the specific of that is the, you know, that the, that the album had come out, you know, two days before, right. um, uh, which is, you know, which I think is a fantastic. I mean, his black star record is, you know, I think it's, it's great. And mm-hmm. I was listening to it all weekend and thinking, my God, you know, he's making this really interesting, challenging, you know, fascinating music look at this this is great and then instantly you know while i was listening to the record he was gone and i think it it was very different than if it had been kind of you know a five-year slow fade sure he didn't feel sort of out in front of us in the same way i think that really affected my my own response to it and, and for a lot of people i think beyond that that you know we're all we all know how to deal with we all know how to process rock and roll deaths you know, uh-huh. we're all used to overdoses and plane crashes and murders and weird things happen. Like we've all, you know, we've all dealt with that. What we really haven't dealt with that much are watching our idols, you know, get old and get sick and die the way people die. Right. And it's really, there's very few of the monumental figures where that's been the story. And and it's amazing. I mean, back it up. It's not just the fact that, you know, Mick and Keith and Dylan and McCartney and those guys are still around. I mean, Little Richard and Fats Domino and Chuck Berry and Jerry Lee Lewis, like those guys are still alive, right? you know? <laughs> so we really haven't had to learn how to, you know, how to mourn these figures. Um, and I, it's been, you know, it was it was fascinating to watch it. It's fascinating to watch you know, what it was on, on social media, what it was oh, to watch, you know, a Facebook, I mean, sort of everybody collectively gathering on Facebook to grieve for right. Bowie. And that stuff was, I mean, that could feel kind of cheapened or, you know, sort of not right. But there was something really beautiful about it. I mean, people sharing what he had meant to them, what the music had meant, you know, people talking about their own encounters or dealings with him. And it just became you know, this, this kind of ongoing dialogue in a really, really interesting way. So, you know, look, his, his impact obviously was, was enormous. Um, I think that, you know, as the, really the model for um, somebody who could, who would, you know, change persona and image and direction, um, whether their audience was ready for that or not, um, who, you know, was really following his own, uh, you know, his own direction and, and, and willing to surprise or disappoint or freak out fans and, right. you know, be uh, his own person in that way and really be a voice for the, you know, the, the, the freaks and the misfits and the, you know, uh, the, the, all the outliers in the world, not just in, you know, in, in, the, in the specifics of the music, but in the way that he carried himself and his work. You know they, 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 that impact is is un, is undeniable. Um, so I think there's you know there's a lot of things that were going on here. I mean to bring this all the way full circle, there's a really interesting encounter between Nina Simone and Bowie um, <laughs> that I found in the you know in the research for the Nina book, um, where she had you know she had taken her daughter to go see him at, at, at Madison Square Garden. She went out to a club that night. 
just kind of to go out. And she ran in. He was there with his entourage. She ran into him. And he summoned her over and had him sit with her, you know, had her, had her sit with him. And when she left, asked if he could call her. And he called her at 3 o'clock in the morning that night and then called her every night at 3 o'clock in the morning for the next month. And, you know, what she remembered him saying was, don't let people tell you that you're crazy. They're going to tell you that you're crazy and you're not. It's just that you're an artist and a genius and you're out in a place where there are very few of us out here. And it was really at a time where she needed that, a real validation, um, that she could be as independent and as, uh, uh, you know, as committed to her work as she was. And here was, you know, somebody who was, you know, at the absolute peak of his game and, you know, as big a rock star in the world, not only expressing his, his respect and his admiration, but saying, you know, you're an artist, so you stick to your guns. That's what we do. Right. Yeah, and and I think that my the thing I found interesting about it, I I took my kids to the Bowie exhibit in Chicago, mm-hmm. not not kind of realizing the effect it was going to have on them. I just you know I mean I just thought that it would be a nice introduction. Right. Well, my my son uh, Matt, who was nine at the time, mm-hmm. he stood by the. Space Oddity exhibit for about six revolutions of the song. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. that was his thing. And then my daughter, uh, my daughter Sarah, who's the biggest of the boy fans, although Matt would probably claim that he is, Sarah, you know, was entranced with Ziggy Stardust. And then my daughter Mary was entranced with the fashion and the suits and, and right. you know, all of that. And then to see all of those different eras that were covered – and then were covered by people's memory of Bowie, I just thought was really neat because it wasn't, uh, you know, some sort of singular um, expression of him. It was all kinds of different things. Right, so all these different ways in. Um, and that isn't even, I mean, and I, and I unfortunately missed the exhibit. It didn't come to New York. I, I was not in the right place at the right time. But all of these other elements of him, too, as a as a pioneer with, you know, on the Internet and with a lot of, you know, understanding digital media long oh, yeah. before most people, you know, got that. Um, and his, the whole, you know, the impact on the financial world through the, the whole Bowie bonds uh-huh. thing of selling, you know, the uh, bonds against the future revenues from his catalog. Uh, uh-huh. This was somebody who was, you know, really operating at a very, a very high, a very high altitude uh, uh-huh. on, in, in so many different you know, so many different fields and so many different ways to to think about the project that he was, you know, that he was undertaking. Yeah, well, I I very much enjoyed your um, writing about it, and and I sure have enjoyed being able to talk to you about all of this. Um, really great interview, and and thanks for coming on. Well, thanks for thanks for having me, and uh, and and going through all this different stuff. It's, you yeah, know, it's nice to have it all out there. So. <laughs> well, thanks, Alan. All right, thank you, Dale. Thanks for listening to my interview with Alan Light. Go out and buy his book and go see the movie, the Oscar-nominated movie, What Happened to Miss Simone. This has been The Dale Wiley Show. Visit me at dalewileyshow.net. Buy some books. Throw some money. Copyright 2016.